We are, um, we have had some really great mind kind of blowing ideas thrown at us, which thank you to Billy. Um, Rob is going to come up now and talk to you about Hyperloop, which I look forward to riding to Chicago sometime soon, right? Um, so Rob Miller, come on up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, how do you follow Billy? Uh, Astro bio futurist was not in the options on career day <laughs> for me. So uh, thank you for a great presentation. I'm going to try to bring a fraction of the energy that, that you did. Um, for me here, uh, I'm, the, I'm the chief marketing officer for Hyperloop TT, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Um, handling marketing, communication, passenger experience, uh, and design. Um, but my background is in neuroscience. So the idea of coming to a, a biomimicry for so is something that I've been advocating for within the Hyperloop space since uh, for, for the past six years. And um, being invited to a conference on it is, uh, for me personally and professionally, uh, quite exciting. So uh, I look forward to hearing from all of you. I look forward to your ideas. And uh, we'll talk to you a little bit today about Hyperloop. I assume everyone here knows what a Hyperloop is. Am I, am I okay? There's some here. There's some here that don't. I think we're we'll we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll introduce you. I mean, we're not to throw you out, but we'll we'll give you a little bit of background. <laughs> nice loop. Um, we'll talk about progress to date. We'll talk about what we're doing here in um, in the 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 uh, Cleveland area and the first U.S. Hyperloop. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we're thinking about um, nature and natural systems influencing our design in the passenger space and, and overall, um, and we'll give you a little view of the future. So um, with that, let's start with the state of transportation today. I, ha I have the clicker, I guess, so there we go. All right, so first of all, we within our lifetimes, we, we're in this unique space where we've... Um, those of us that, that grew up as I did, we went from an analog to a digital world and that uh, governed by Moore's law that has uh, brought everything into, the, into our hand. Uh, and we've seen so much development. Um, so moving bits and bytes. We've seen a lot of development in moving bits and bytes in our lifetime, um, but not molecules, not goods and, and services. So uh, you know, a pandemic aside, and we're, we're already back to, to pre-pandemic measures um, by most regards. Uh, I don't know how you flew here, Billy, but my spare, Spirit Airlines flight was completely full and not very comfortable. <laughs> so we know, that, we know that transportation today is, is defined by gridlock. It has a massive cost to our economy. Airports are already back to pre-pandemic pre-pandemic levels, um, and then we're, we're governed by limited velocity and that we really um, have, have limitations defined by friction on how quickly we move. Uh, the infrastructure is outdated. Um, it's inefficient. Uh, it's, uh, uh, for, for most of us in, in, in Los, I'm not a Los Angeles person, but I am now. Uh, I grew up down down the street in Pittsburgh. Um, the the noise pollution is is significant in most urban environments, um, and the time loss. The uh, you know we're commutes now. This is pre pandemic. the The average commute was 28 minutes in the U S., which reached a record in in 2020. Um, we've uh, we've t gone away from that a little bit. Now a lot of people are returning back to work, but. Um, Clogging the roads are now the goods and services that are coming to your home, especially in the urban environment. So it's the Postmates and the other delivery services. So we've uh, we've supplemented some of us traveling for uh, traveling 30 minutes an hour. It's not uncommon to have uh, a two-hour commute within Los Angeles, um, New York, some of the major cities of the world, um, and that's honestly one of the absolute biggest wastes of time. And there's a there's a massive there's a massive impact on the economy. Um, Sixty six billion euros in pollution, uh, air pollution alone, cost in in Europe. Um, we're we're shaving 
months and years off of our lives in some places in the world because of the air pollution and of which the CO2 emissions, 25% of those CO2 emissions come from transportation. We had this very short window in March or April, May, 2020, to see what the world looks like when we slow down those, those carbon emissions, especially from transportation. And um, the result was, was fairly visible. Los Angeles had the cleanest air in the U.S. for, for a day or a couple of days. Um, there, were towns in, there were towns in India that hadn't seen the Himalayas for 30 years. Uh, so the, um, uh, you know, particularly in the, in the developing world, we're losing, we're losing big, big chunks of our life um, because we're polluting from transportation. Most public transportation systems are heavily subsidized. With every trip you take on the New York Metro, um, the, the, uh, the, the taxpayer is footing 75 cents for each, for each Metro trip. There's only, one, there's only one real public transportation system in the world that's profitable, and that's the Hong Kong Metro. And it's only because the Hong Kong Metro owns the real estate around the transportation system. So uh, they're polluting, uh, they're subsidized, and there's, there's massive amounts of congestion. And then, the, and, and most importantly, it's the, this, this massive impact on the environment uh, that as we're thinking about building transportation systems for today and tomorrow, and with Hyperloop, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about far away future, I'm talking about something that we're, we're building today. So hopefully, Billy, we're coming from the we're coming from thinking about it, dreaming about the future to, to it's today, tomorrow that, that we're, we're bringing Hyperloop to you, that um, building a transportation system needs to be, needs to address these, uh, these areas. And so the pressing part of the presentation is, is now through. Um, we're gonna talk about the, the, the opportunity for future transportation systems for governments that are thinking about um, how do you best serve your citizens? How, how do you best build transportation systems that are profitable, that can have a return on investment, so that you have this combination of public-private sector coming together to build something that can be profitable. Um, for, for users, uh, my tall guy in the middle seat on Spirit Airlines is not the ideal transportation <laughs> scenario. Uh, it's almost inhumane. And sorry, I hope no one here works for Spirit Airlines, because. I'm probably going to draw on that experience a few, a few times more. Uh, it's almost inhumane and, and, you know, throw a little bag of peanuts at us in, in the middle of the flight for $2. Uh, it's, it's, we've, we've gone backwards in terms of experience for, for transportation. It's no longer a journey. You see these travel posters from the 50s and 60s about going to these far off places. And it, it, it seems wonderful, but the reality is something different. Um, and then the sustainability aspect. Uh, we, we, if you can build a, a zero emissions transportation system, um, one that has the potential to um, utilize renewable energy uh, for operations, then, then you're really talking about something special. And I'm going to make my argument today that Hyperloop fits in, fits in all of those different categories. If we were sitting here in 1922, instead of 2022, we would still be talking about the end of the pandemic um, and how we got through it. Uh, but we would also be optimistic for the future of transportation in that in our lifetimes, we would have went from something like horse and buggy to automobiles, to airplanes. And we would have seen that, that massive change in, in 20, 30 years. Uh, but you know what we when I ask this question, what defines the area, the, er, the next era of of human mobility? We have to go back to everything in black and white. Um, and the reality is that progress is not linear, and progress is not guaranteed. So you can look at you can look at some of the great uh, great civilizations, and you know we draw we draw from 
we draw from examples 2000 years ago and then those civilizations have have uh have crumbled and and uh and for us especially in transportation uh change is very difficult for a number of reasons but change is difficult and it's not guaranteed so it's something that we're unapologetically working towards um, with Hyperloop or the next Hyperloop or the next iteration. Um, but what, would, what will define the next era of human mobility? It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be efficient, highly efficient. It needs to be profitable. Um, it needs to be absolutely safe, uh, high speed. We say frictionless or nearly frictionless and then passenger centric. I'm going to show you a, a short video that introduces a little bit about Hyperloop, and we can kind of go from there. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can play this. Imagine. Imagine a capsule. Imagine a capsule that can carry people. Placed inside a depressurized tube, the air removed to eliminate resistance. Not traveling on rails, but actually levitating above them. Capable of reaching airplane speeds and beyond on the ground. This is a Hyperloop, and it is amazing. Even more amazing, at Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, we haven't been imagining, we've been building for the better part in five years. And amazing is where we started. We're transforming the passenger experience, putting comfort and safety at the center of everything we're doing. Our reimagined linear electric motor is powered by sustainable solar energy, propelling the capsule on a completely new, incredibly efficient passive levitation system. With these two breakthroughs, our system is capable of giving energy back to the grid. And when something didn't exist, we invented it. Introducing Vibranium a composite material that monitors speed, capsule integrity, and atmospheric condition in real time, a new benchmark in passenger safety. And we're not done. Our team of over 800 strong, a worldwide intellectual ecosystem of thinkers and problem solvers, tackle each day with the humble goal of changing the world. With its speed and efficiency, the Hyperloop will rewrite the rules of travel and mobility. But that's just one side of the story there's another side that will have a far greater impact. It's the side that redefines how we connect with one another. Where distant friends become neighbors, countries become neighborhoods. And everybody who inhabits this big, crazy world of ours grows a little closer together. Just imagine that. So the, the, the tech is fairly simple. It's a, it's a next generation uh, maglev train that was uh, a, a form of maglev that was first developed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the, in the 1990s. They use passive levitation, which, which doesn't require the track to be uh, super cooled or doesn't require the track to be powered, um, which is a massive, a massive energy sa uh, save. Um, there's a vacuum system that, um, that will pump down the tube to about equivalent of 200,000 feet of altitude. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially, uh, it's all, it's using all electric, all electric power, all electric energy. Um, we talk about speed. Um, this is not the, it's is not the theoretical speed by drawing a, a straight line, um, between the cities of Cleveland and Chicago to Cleveland and Pittsburgh. This is the speed that was studied. Um, over an 18 month uh, peer reviewed uh, feasibility study. So Cleveland to Chicago, we can do in uh, 47 minutes quite comfortably. Now this is 47 minutes, not in a, not in a, uh, not in a five point restraint <laughs> roller coaster ride. This is, uh, this is 47 minutes uh, where you can stand um, and carry a hot cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Um, Throughout throughout any point of the trip, 0.1 g acceleration acceleration throughout um, Cleveland to Pittsburgh, uh, two hours. I'm sorry, two hours and 15 minutes took me three yesterday, last night, 3:15, um, 24 minutes in a 
in a hyperloop system. So speed is not speed is uh, people when people talk about hyperloop, they talk a lot about speed. For for some of us, it's it's exciting, but for most of the people that are involved in hyperloop, it's really the the efficiency and sustainability uh, aspect. Safety is is a is a critical thing when you're talking about hyperloop, but if you look at rail today, the, the two main causes of accident are something interferes with the motion of travel. Um, a cow on the track is, you know, is an example. Uh, birds and, 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 and a hundred other things. Or, um, or it's a, a user, user error. So we have a completely automated system. It's in a, it's in a enclosed, it's an enclosed device within a tube. Um, it's immune to weather conditions, no grade, tra- tra- no grade crossing, um, no traffic. And it's uh, uh, electric propulsion. So this was, uh, as a part of the feasibility study, a third party um, consultant said that um, in their mind, Hyperloop was the most energy efficient mechanized means of travel that had ever been invented by humans. So, and, and as part of that study, we looked at the we looked at the energy cost and the energy gain. So if you think of a above ground hyperloop system from Cleveland to uh, Cleveland to Chicago, uh, we're about what, 550 kilometers, 300 some miles. Um, think of photo, photo, photovoltaics uh, cells on, on top, uh, solar, solar, solar panels on top. You have uh, you know, essentially a massive solar farm between here and Cleveland and uh, Hopefully, in the next few days, you guys will tell me what natural process is going to replace fault of the takes. But for now, um, we're, we're using solar panels. And uh, the reality is that we're looking at the, the potential of capturing more energy than you're using in operations, which is fairly radical um, and uh, was fairly unbelievable. For a lot of people, when they first hear that, it's like, collecting more energy than, than you're using by using a transportation system. Um, and then, then we, then Billy and I start to talk about the possibilities of, of what we can do. Um, you know, can you power the city of Cleveland for a day? Um, can, um, the pylons, uh, uh, the pylons, can we use the pylons as, uh, places to plug into? Um, can we give energy back to the, to the landowners along the route? Uh, you get a, a lot of fun things that happen. So um, solar energy, um, you can use wind. There's the kinetic through regenerative braking. And in places, you can use geothermal as well. It's important that, uh, you know, I've been told that one of the most efficient forms of flow, and essentially when we're talking about transportation, we're talking about flow, one of the most efficient forms of flow in, in the body and natural systems is the movement of red blood cells. And uh, the problem with traffic today, the problem with transportation today is that we're moving on a two-dimensional grid. So the more we can bring transportation three-dimensional, the greater opportunity we have to, to, uh, to alleviate some of those concerns. Hyperloop um, works above ground. Hyperloop works at ground. Hyperwork, Hyperloop is very interesting underground as well. And, and a lot of you may know that this is the area where Elon Musk especially is working on is uh is working on uh, faster boring systems it's a fraction of the diameter of high speed rail uh so cost uh, cost is a fraction of the cost of of why we don't see a lot of uh a lot of underground transportation today so what what happens when you go above ground is that you have this opportunity for um life above life below and the the story of a lot of cities is the story of neighborhoods divided by transportation so that so and the story of I and mean, when you get into the rural environment it's the animal crossings and a number of other things so uh, so for us the the um, the life above life below is is uh, is very interesting uh, to back here a second you um, you know we've we look at examples like the high line in New York to, uh, to build passenger friendly systems with it, or to build uh, friendly systems within, uh, within cities. Um, you can look at the, the pylons below as not only a source of energy, but, um, uh, you know, a way to, a way not to bisect 
neighborhoods. And the, so if you were to come visit us in, in Los Angeles or in Toulouse, we have, um, we have mock, full scale mockups of what it would feel like to be inside of a Hyperloop. Essentially, it's about the size of a, of a regional jet. Um, if we're talking about a freight system, it's a, it could be a little bit, a little bit larger, but, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a space and there's, there are no windows obviously in a Hyperloop as well. Um, so we've, we've thought a lot about, uh, a lot about the, what's the anti spirit middle seat experience for passengers, um, 28 to 50 people maximum within a, a Hyperloop. So you can, you can build. Uh, you can build passenger experience not based on class, not based on first class or business class or or sardine class, but based on use case. So, what do you want to do while while you're in, in a hyperloop? And and for me, it's the you know the 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 ultimate environment. My my living room couch, moving from from one place to another. So, um, you know, for 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 others, it's it's really about um, you know how much productivity can you do? Um, we can build uh, we can build a full restaurant capsule. Um, for Los Angeles to Las Vegas route, which is um, one of the most dangerous high, one of the most dangerous highways in, in the U.S., um, five and a half hours on a good day, um, you could uh, the capsules could be sponsored by casinos, so you could have a Bellagio capsule that transports you into the into the Bellagio environment right when you board in right when you board in Los Angeles, and uh, just a number of the possibilities when you think about transportation that's. Um, you know, it's not these master trains of a thousand people, but 28 to 28 to 30 people. Restaurants could sponsor dining cars. Um, it gets back a little bit to the the uh, the, the Orient Express model of of passenger experience. Um, we we released our first uh, images of and uh, of a mock-up we're building for the the first Hyperloop system, and I'll play you kind of a, a walk through here and talk a little bit about how we how we thought about it. Um, uh, utilizing the natural environment to give a little better experience. It's a new form of transportation. So we have a design, uh, design principle of form follows function, but dictated by ceremony. So we're asking you to step into uh, a transportation system that's going to take you over 700 miles an hour on the ground in a tube in a windowless system. Uh, for about 10% of people, that's quite exciting. But um, there's, a, there's a high percentage that would, uh, that would uh, have concern for the first time that you ride. So um, we've thought about uh, how can we you know, how can we keep this that's, uh, so that it's something that's dictated by ceremony, ceremony, the things that we know and experience day by day. Um, we don't want it to look like an airplane. We don't want it to look like a train. We want it to feel a little bit better. So um, we, use the, we use a little bit of the natural world to help us to, to, to design this experience. Um, this uh, light of the, the idea of kind of uh, being in a forest with these tall trees inspired the, the, the light environment. Um, uh, there are uh, requirements for um, fireproof, and we, we looked at the the lily pad as as an example of uh, a kind of a a kind of a skin that we can that we can use for uh, for the seating. Um, there's a light mode and a and a dark mode, like uh, like everything these days. Um, we actually build our presentations as well in light mode or dark mode because everyone has a preference. So same with travel. Um, we looked at bioluminescent warmth as a uh, as an inspiration for our, our our light mode on on hyperloop, our dark mode on hyperloop, and uh, the the the, um, the the armrest on the left hand side comes out and it's a, and it's a stretchable skin. I don't think it's visible here, but we looked at um, we looked at the uh, the frog as an example of what um, what stretchable skin might be might be interesting. Um, yeah. Within the system, um, we've looked at uh, we've looked at hives. We looked at honeycombs in building uh, multiple tube systems, uh, a number of other things. But um, 
what I'm here to say is that we've only scratched the surface. And I'm not up here to tell you how we're using biomimicry to build the next form of transportation. I'm up here to tell you that we'd love to have your help to utilize biomimicry to help to build, build in the next form of transportation. So um, part of the message is that the Hyperloop is coming, but we would, we would love, to, love to learn more about how we can integrate things that we're talking about over the next three days um, into our design systems. Okay, there we go. Not, not yet. We'll get there. Uh, it's being built today. Our full scale, um, we have about a quarter mile full scale system in uh, Toulouse, France, which is the aerospace capital of Europe. Uh, we've been operating there for a few years. Um, the all of our systems are being all of our systems are being tested there. This was the first capsule, the first passenger capsule. Um, designed in designed in Spain. That's on site in that's on site in Toulouse. Uh, to give you a sense of size, that's me on the left walking uh, walking through our system. Uh, the safety isolation valve, which is uh, placed every five to ten kilometers, which um, which will shut down the system for maintenance and for for safety situations was designed in, in California. That's me again on the right hand side to give you a sense of, a sense of size. Uh, the vacuum container system was developed, co-developed with a company called Label, who 160, 70 years ago invented the vacuum pump. Um, that every, that's stationed every, it's a series of 10 to 12 pumps and stationed every 10 kilometers, which will pump down and maintain the, maintain the vacuum and then the capsule on the, on the bottom right. So that's our, that's our hardware show, that's our show and tell. Um, the mo one of the most exciting things since we're here in Cleveland is, is that um, we, we've progressed more locally really than anywhere else in the world. So the, the potential to build a first Hyperloop system is, uh, is greatest, we think, here in Cleveland. So we've, um, in 2018, we, um, along with NUACA and a number of other partners, implemented a, a feasibility study, a multi-fate feasibility study that looked at uh, the feasibility from uh, from a hyperloop from from Cleveland to Chicago, and then we added on an extension to Pittsburgh as well. Uh, these are these are some of the we looked at the absolute straight route, which is a uh, straight line. Hyperloop loves straight lines; that means you can go fairly quick. Uh, a lot of that would need to be would need to be underground. We looked at following a toll road. We looked at a hybrid. And the hybrid came out as the uh, the um, the best the best route of the three, uh, most economical, and um, the times that I showed earlier were based on this based on this hybrid route. Um, we've had uh, we've had a number of a number of partners through the process. We started a Great Lakes Hyperloop Consortium. Over ninety entities were involved. Um, I'm uh, I'm pleased to say OAI is a is a uh, is a is a member there as well. And essentially what this, uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, we need to build the Hyperloop locally. So um, the, the technologies that power the Hyperloop and the materials that power the Hyperloop um, should, come from, should come from the region. And then we looked at the, uh, the, economic, uh, the economic benefit. And uh, when you study a, a mass transportation system like this, the return on investment if you ever make, if you ever build a profitable system, it's something like 90 to 100 years. Um, High-speed rail generally it's 40 to 50 years before you, before you would turn a profit. Um, with Hyperloop, it was between 15 to 18 years. It was, uh, it was guessed that the system would be, the system would be profitable, and that's specifically studied for the ridership um, in this route. So you can imagine that uh, it's case by case basis in places where. There's uh, even greater demand. That number, that number goes down, and that's that's the real that's the real benefit. Um, the the you know essentially by by building a 50 lane highway between Chicago and Cleveland, um, you're replacing all the CO2 emissions of the of the gas guzzling cars. We're moving to electric, but we're still at only two percent adoption. So uh, 
right now today, uh, it's 143 million of tons, uh, tons of CO2 that could be replaced over over 25 years. Um, we're working on 150 different routes and, and projects around the world. Um, there's also uh, we've had we've had this massive supply chain uh, supply chain issue in that uh, in the the past uh, past 18 months um, ports are overcrowded. Uh, we're working with the port of Hamburg, which is one of the most innovative ports in the world. Uh, if you go into the port of Hamburg, you're you'll see that the that the entire process is automated so that from from the ship um, automated vehicles will take you to the storage will take you to the trucks uh, amazing process things moving um, highly innovative but then there's a 40 minute wait at the gate for for trucks to trucks to come in and uh, every truck on the road has 40 times the impact of a of a passenger vehicle um, and these are all within urban environments. So if we have the opportunity to move cargo at, um, at hyperloop speeds to move these ports inland, uh, it, it provides a, 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 massive, uh, a massive benefit for, for building hyperloop. And here's a, here's a quick, quick video on what the freight application looks like. Hi. And you have to go. Go on. I died. And then finally, I'd like to touch on the, the how we're building Hyperloop because the, the how we feel is, is uh, hopefully as revolutionary as, as, the, as the what. Um, back in 2013, 2014, um, our founder was, uh, you know, had, had this idea of, I mean, if you, if you were, uh, Billy, if you were not going to build a Hyperloop today, Right. If we start, if we're starting our own company today, uh, it would take a massive, a massive effort in it, just in engineering alone, where it's something like two dozen, three, three dozen disciplines, uh, aeronautics, aerospace, um, the vacuum technology, nuclear physics. So for us to, for me and you to start that, start that in LA, we're going to need, um, engineers from, from, from all those different disciplines to help us to to bring this to life. Um, most of those engineers are, are gainfully employed at places that may or may not be in Los Angeles or may or may not be in Cleveland. Uh, and to bring them on requires a massive capital investment. So the price tag to get started to build a new form of transportation, we're looking at $500 million to a billion dollars. Um, and that's uh, for, for, in, for investors, um, you know, we're not building a new app, which we can launch in six months and we can see, we can turn profitability. This is infrastructure technology, which has a 10 year or more horizon to revenue. Um, so the, the idea of raising a billion dollars immediately to build Hyperloop is, is a tough one. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen, uh, we haven't seen change in, in this industry. We haven't seen new forms of transportation develop is because of the timeline and the hard cost. However, we do have, uh, you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and that, and that we've, uh, you know, the, the vacuum technology that's gone into the CERN, the CERN Large Hadron Collider um, and, and, and two dozen other examples of, of people that have done amazing things who have a little bit of time to spend on um, a project like Hyperloop and may want to be involved, not as a full, not full time, but five hours, 10 hours a week. Um, so we, we in the beginning, uh, put a call to action after Elon Musk released a white paper on on Alpha paper on Hyperloop. Actually, Hyperloop is an idea that 
goes back 160 years. Uh, two gentlemen tried to build uh, a pneumatic tube system underneath New York City in the 1860s. The first patent for Hyperloop was uh, 1919, I believe, Robert Goddard. So we've been, we've been thinking about Hyperloop for a long time. Um, we're now just bringing it to life. Uh, so in the very beginning, we did a call to action. that Anyone wanted to, be, wanted to be involved in this initial feasibility study to determine if this was something that would work or not. Um, we, had, we had this tremendous response of, of, of engineers from all the companies that, that you would imagine. Um, we told them that, uh, 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 you know, give us 10 hours a week in this initial three to six months. We'll give you equity in the company via stock options. And, uh, and we, five months later, we got the, the initial feasibility study from 100 engineers and said it's not exactly how um, it was designed in the alpha paper, but, but uh, all of the technologies exist already. It's just a matter of implementing it. So we took that and we built a company around that, that mentality of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the essentially the, the people um, the people who, the people who are helping to build it are the ones that are, are gaining equity in the company. More than 50% of the, of the, uh, of the ownership of the company lies within what we call our contributors. Um, fast forward to today, we have a, we have a model of, we have about 50, 60 employees worldwide. Um, we have 50 different partners, a little over 50 different partners to helping us bring it to life. We have more than 800 um, 800 what we call contributors who are spending uh, 15 minutes to 10 hours a week um, helping us to move different pieces forward. Um, we've been fortunate enough to, to have two Harvard Business School case studies written and then the second one is being taught right now. So we have the opportunity to, to go into Harvard once or twice a year to, to, uh, to talk about this with our students. We were, um, we were a, a, a completely remote company um, way back in 2015, 2016, we have Toulouse and we have Los Angeles, but uh, most of our teams were working remote, which was, doesn't seem radical now that um, all of our teams are by, by Zoom, but allowed us to step into, step into 2020 um, and not really miss a beat. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the sense of, of how, we're, um, how we're bringing kind of these visionaries, these visionaries together. I mentioned that, that we have these kind of best in class partnerships labeled vacuum is, is one. Um, we, you know, since the, a lot of these companies are working in transportation, um, but, uh, they're working on rail systems. And so Hitachi rails and other who's, uh, who's, uh, developed the systems for, for high speed rail, but their, their team, their engineers kind of want to be involved in, in thinking about the future and developing systems for the future. So they came in as a partner, as an investor, and help us to build the, the communication systems for, for Hyperloop. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you know, especially in terms of optimizing our system, there's the, you know, we're on the iPhone 4 version of, of Hyperloop right now. Um, we're continually iterating to, to, to make it more efficient, to make it a little better. Um, from a design perspective as well, we're continually iterating. So. Um, look forward to, to any thoughts or ideas or, or questions that you have uh, on, um, you know, kind of taking your learnings and, and bringing, it into, bringing it into Hyperloop. So with that, I'll stop, pause, and, and take questions and comments. Cheers. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, we, we're here in the room. We're going to take two questions from the room, and then we'll go to the online um, all right, Claire, could, there's a gentleman in the white shirt and then the blue in the back, the young woman. Hi, Go Claire. ahead. Um, so I actually have two questions. Um, one is just like a general question about like, what's your cost? You know, how much would you be charging someone to go from, let's say, Cleveland to Chicago? And then my second question is, you know, when we're talking about, you know, really redefining infrastructure um, what steps is your company taking to see the next generation? Uh, thanks for two really good questions. First, the, the cost, uh, uh, yeah. Hyperloop is something that, I mean, when we started this, we, we didn't know we needed to design it for everyone. So it's not, uh, you know, I've, I've lived in Japan and I commuted on the, uh, the bullet train. Uh, it's not a cheap 
commute, right? It's a you know $160 one-way ticket from Tokyo to Osaka. Uh, Europe uh, Europe is, is similar. I mean, their airlines are 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 um, uh, there's 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 dynamic pricing, so prices can be right now prices are pretty crazy. Um, we wanted to get it down to a bus ticket, the price of a bus ticket. Uh, where we are, based on the feasibility study, is somewhere around commuter rail. So one-way ticket from Chicago to Cleveland, Cleveland, Chicago, I don't remember badly, is, is about $40 for, for a ticket. So um, very competitive uh, in, in returns to, in regards to as an, as, a, as an alternative versus airplanes. I think it's cheaper than the gas cost right now between the two cities. Um, the second question was... So I mentioned like actually your infrastructure. Sorry. Uh, so as you're building your infrastructure, um, as you move forward, you know the next generation. When we're in, you know, 2100, what, you know, how is that going to change, or are you anticipating a change, you know, as we continue to evolve and progress? Yeah, I mean, we're 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 looking at. So we have a sustainability team that's focused on this this topic precisely so um areas of concrete areas of steel um you know how we what the latest development are in materials and uh you know how we can minimize both minimize our footprint uh, maximize the longevity of the system um localize the production so that um you know we're uh, you know we're providing minimal footprint we've looked at composite fibers for composite uh, tube structures as well so we're continuing to look at um, the materials and material science to help to to help to to continually iterate on what we have today. Great question, thanks. Okay, there you go. Couple, yeah, so a couple things. Uh, one, why uh, <clears throat> or have you ever considered not using a vacuum, using a helium oxygen mix, uh, where you can get an eighty five percent reduction in atmospheric drag, uh, similar to the vacuum. And second, uh, in, in using innovative materials that you were talking about, uh, have you ever thought about aluminum oxynitrate uh, for your tubes and pods uh, instead of steel? Uh, no rust, no uh, no painting, uh, much longer, much uh, greater longevity. Uh, we have for the first question, we actually we have a patent on a mixture of noble gases that would uh, allow for a allow for a kind of a lower a lower vacuum profile so that's something we're we're it's a great question that's something we're absolutely uh, absolutely considering um for the second uh, personally i'm not sure but i will um but connect with me later and i'll make sure that if it's not on our radar that it, that it is thanks all right we've got one more in house and then we'll go to you Britt. okay so when like, 47 was introduced like there was a piano and plenty um, and no center seat, and then eventually, to make it cheaper and everyone could use it, Spirit Airlines took over and gave you that middle seat, right? So how do you, this is perfect right at the beginning, but eventually it was like, hey, you could make money in half the time with the Spirit Airlines model, you know, how do you keep the purity of this as you move forward? Uh, for us, we're, we're licensing the technology, I mean, it's a great question, we're, we're licensing the technology, so um, we would, we would be running a profitable company without doing anything. We could completely uh, give passenger to someone else. And our fear is that when, when we do that and when you're in these meetings, the, they talk about the, the inches saved and the dollar amount gained. Um, so we want to make sure that it's a principle for, uh, for the Hyperloop that uh, it's built around from the inside out rather from the outside in. There will be you know, when we're in the age of Hyperloop and we're riding Hyperloops, there will be, unfortunately, Beard Airlines and, and others running it. But uh, as much as we can, um, we want to promote that uh, that philosophy. Britt, can you share anything online? Like, so, yeah, he, he pointed to you. Yeah. So I think the biggest concern from the chat that I'm seeing is the reliance upon um, the materials and how we incorporate it with our existing environment, especially as we're already investing into new infrastructure. How are you, you know, working alongside that or maybe getting ahead of it versus building at the same time um, and maybe creating a system where it is only for the 1%? Uh, 
Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, I mean, these, that's a great question. It comes a little bit to the answer that I, that I gave before is that we're, um, you know, it's a, it's a new form of infrastructure above ground. Uh, it is, uh, it is new materials. The advantage that it, the advantage that you have when you consider it over a 30 year time frame is the massive savings. Um, we look at the entire complete life, life cycle. There's a massive savings versus other forms of transportation. Um, in conjunction with that, you need to continually look at ways to ways to minimize that construction and build footprint. Um, underground is a, is a little bit of a different story. There's, I think, there's, uh, I mean, you know, when you're um, if you're tunneling, especially in an urban environment, you have opportunities to to save on materials there. So um, it's something that we're we're focusing on. Uh, but in, in everything you do, we need to consider the, the full life cycle. And that's what we're looking at. All right, Brett, another question. And then I think we'll be, oh, you got one. Well, I'm going to have to hold on. We're going to go right up there to Henry or who's sitting next to Henry. Hi, guys. Um, so my question has to do with like the future of it. So say this hyperlo sorry, Hyperloop is like set up and everything's in function. Um, what happens if the like Earth starts shifting? What have you guys have thought about, because it's going so fast, if there's like the smallest shift in any of the platforms, like what's going to happen to that? Like how, how have you guys start thinking about that? Uh, one, of the, one of the great things about, uh, about the building Hyperloop is that you, you know, I mentioned we're standing on the shoulders of giants and um, it's, no, it's no different in seismic uh, isolation technology. Um, the Japanese bullet train have 60 years of operation without a single fatality. That requires a much more precise track than than Hyperloop. Uh, the Alaskan pipeline built in the 1970s can withstand a 9.1 on on the Richter scale. So uh, the technology is there to absolutely make it safe in in earthquake prone environments. But we that's a great question and one we get asked all the time. All right. Oh, Henry. All right. This is our last one. Uh, so just thinking about this from the, the biological perspective, there's a lot of biological systems that transport things, blood, whatnot. But a key aspect of many of those is that whatever it is they're transporting doesn't, uh, you don't need to stop your red blood cells to let off oxygen and nutrients and take on carbon dioxide. So has there been thought on ways to essentially disembark passengers on the go for local stops? Oh, oh, we're back. Please. Let's hang <laughs> uh, so we, to my knowledge we haven't but it's actually i mean it's an interesting let's let's grab a cup of coffee and let's let's chat through it and these are the kind of conversations that i hope to have this uh this couple of days thank you for that thought all right well thank you very uh, much rob thank you Daryl. thanks everybody all right we're now to one of our breaks again. We'll start again at 11.30 with our panel. If my panelists could come down right now. Um, and you guys have been great about leaving and coming back right on time. So I appreciate that. All right.